Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Fenbeck from the Zero Project. My welcome to you and our distinguished panel and speakers here this afternoon and in particular, let's greet with a warm welcome Minister Anne Rabbit from Ireland. Before handing over to our able and esteemed chairman, Carol Morgan of the WHO, I should like briefly to introduce this very high level session to you. This gathering may have been months in the making, but here we are at last. As you know, the Zero Project believes in the power of innovation, and this includes innovation in the broadest sense. Alongside practices, we have always looked at public policies as well in our research although we fully recognize the difference in the innovation they require. The main difference between them is, of course, that the impact of innovative public policies is much higher, at a much higher level. Think, for example, of the ADA, of the American Disability Act. They are, consequently, much more difficult to replicate and adopt across countries. To try to address this problem, we decided that one way as we are trying this here today, might be to bring together various stakeholders at the highest level. And this we have done. In this instance, governments, government agencies, UN agencies, and the European Commission have come together here for this event and present together. Since we have always been told that this is just not possible to do this, I'm, I'm not aware that it has ever been done before, and we're really proud and, uh, and expecting uh, a lot of interesting outcome today. It's nothing is guaranteed, but it's, it's, a, it's an innovation in itself. We are here as a very concrete result of the Zero Project Ambassador Circle, uh, which my colleague Robin Tim Weiss, who is not around anymore, he has founded this. He brings together ambassadors to Austria or to, to the United Nations here in Austria together to exchange ideas and connect them. And this group here has also been positively in influenced and also been made possible by these ambassadors. Consequently, in this, our inaugural session to discuss model policies of different kinds, our participants include various governments, as I've mentioned, the European Commission, the WHO, and the ITU. This kickoff meeting will be followed by a report on the session and the models discussed. And at the conference of state parties at the UN this summer, we fully intend to invite all these parties to help develop concepts for the future. Having said all that, thanks for joining us here today. And with that, I'm handing over to our esteemed chair, Cahill Morgan. Thank you, Michael. And uh, friends, colleagues, distinguished guests, your excellencies, to those in the room and those who are joining us around the world, you're all extremely welcome to this very exciting uh, policy forum. We have some excellent speakers who are going to talk about innovations in their own country and we'll hear a little bit about, about that as we move along. But first of all, we're going to start with a short video for our chair, who's Daniela Bass. She's the director of the Division for Inclusive Social Development from the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, who will initially address us. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as policymakers, you have a crucial role in ensuring the full and effective participation of persons with disabilities in all spheres of society. And the United Nations itself has made a call for UN entities and governments to propose model policies and good practices to promote the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD and the Sustainable Development Goals at the SDGs. I shall focus on SDG 4, Quality Education, SDG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, SDG 10, Reduced Inequalities, and SDG 17, Partnerships for the Goals, in the hope that this is going to feed uh, into the SDGs Summit in uh, September this year. To promote the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the implementation of the CRPD and the SDGs, it is necessary to adopt 
a right-based approach that recognizes the inherent dignity and worth of all individuals, regardless of their abilities. And this approach must be reflected in all policies and practices related to education, employment, and equal opportunities. When it comes to education, and I know what I'm talking about since I became paraplegic at the age of six, it is necessary to adopt inclusive education policies that guarantee the rights of persons with disabilities to education on an equal basis with others. And here I'm talking about also assisted, assistive technologies, inclusive learning environments, and of course, skills uh, to help finding or creating employment. Skills and education facilitate creating and finding employment. And employment, well, in this area, it is necessary to adopt policies that promote the employment by eliminating barriers to the participation in the labor market of persons with disabilities. And this can be achieved through the provision of reasonable accommodations, the promotion of equal pay for equal work, and the development of accessible and inclusive work environments. And this creates equal opportunities or even better equity. This can be achieved through the provision of accessible information and communication technologies, the development of accessible public spaces, the elimination of discriminatory attitudes and practices in all aspects of society, including political, cultural, and social activities. To promote the inclusion of persons with disabilities, it is also a matter of economic and social development. By creating inclusive societies that value the contributions and potential of all individuals, we can achieve the SDGs and create a more sustainable, equitable and inclusive world for all. In addition to the policies that I just mentioned, um, there are several good practices that can be implemented in developing countries. For instance, community-based inclusive development programs that aim to integrate persons with disabilities into their communities. Um, these um, involve uh, uh, the formation of self-help groups, uh, provision of microcredit, uh, training of community members in disability inclusive development, ICTs, accessible information and communication technologies, inclusive livelihood programs that often involve uh, providing training and support in small scale entrepreneurships, agriculture and other income generating activities. And of course, capacity building and awareness raising. There are also several good practices that can be implemented in developing and developed countries such as ensuring accessible and inclusive public transportation systems. It is really crucial, such as accessible buses, trains, and other forms of public transportation, as well as, of course, developing accessible transportation infrastructures, such as sidewalks, curb cuts, and accessible building entrance. Workplaces accommodations can greatly improve the employment of persons uh, with disabilities, such as reasonable accommodation, um, flexible work schedules, accessible workspaces, and of course, assistive technologies. And it's also very important uh, to take care of the health care, um, care health care facilities, the training of health care providers in disability inclusive care, and of course, also inclusive health care technologies. And let me conclude with the implementation of the SDG 17 partnerships for the goals. These policies should be inclusive and take into account the diverse needs of persons with disabilities and different kinds of disabilities. Another key aspect of the implementation of SDG is the need for financial and technical support. This can come in the form of government, government funding, international aid, and other forms of support. Let's remember that whatever we do has to be done in consultation and by engaging persons with disabilities in the policy making processes because these impacts are meant to impact in positive the lives of persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Daniela. And um, um, it was really important that we began this particular session in the context of what Daniela had to say. 
um, from a, an SDG a point of view, but also from the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So she has laid the, the groundwork in terms of what underpins member states or governments or multilateral organisations in the work that they're doing in relation to promoting inclusion. So we do really uh, appreciate that. I'm going to say a little bit about the format of this session before we move into presentations and some questions and answers. So this is the topic of policy making and about how we can support member states and not reinvent the wheel in terms of what can be done to promote inclusion of people in all of the aspects of life and living that Daniela had, um, had spoken about, whether it be uh, employment, in education, whether it be in developing partnerships, etc., etc. So that will, that's what we're going to be hearing about over the next um, couple of hours. So the format is very much an interactive session. So we have up to 10 inputs um, from various esteemed guests, and they will be speaking on a very specific um, innovation that they're doing. I will introduce each speaker, and then following that, we will have an opportunity pending time um, to have some interaction between the panelists and some questions that maybe helps us explore a little bit more in depth some of the topics that will, will come up. Uh, each um, speaker has up to eight minutes to present um, on their particular topic, and we will be keeping an eye on time, so we do encourage our speakers to try and stay on track if that's okay. So, um, without further ado, our first presentation is going to be from India, and uh, this is going to be a remote participation. So, we have S.B. Mournia, Deputy Advisor of the National Institute for Transforming India, um, and he's representing the Government of India. And he's going to be talking to us now um, about particular innovations in the Indian context. So, over to you. Thank you, Daniel. And, uh hope I am loud and clear and uh, I request the uh, share my presentation. Okay, can you see it there then, SP? Noted. Can I just check with you, SB Manirachu? Can you see your presentation? No, not yet. Can I? Can you give me access to share? Yeah. Great. Okay, yeah, I think uh, presentation is not, uh, it's the entire screen is shared. I request only share the presentation. Of course, I can go ahead with that. Uh, well, thank you and uh, congratulate the Zero Project for organizing such a wonderful e event and Zero Project uh, to understand what are the innovations, what are the policies happening around the world and uh, including the government policies. Well, this is the National Strategic Framework for Assistive Technologies. We all know that recently World Health Organization came out with a great report which has thrown light of what is the availabilities, industries, innovations, investments happening around the world towards assistive technologies. India is taken a leadership of G20. We all know that India is leading a uh, uh, group of 20 countries and currently this year. We, uh, as per the ten, uh, census 2011, uh, we have about 2.2% of the Indian population as persons with disabilities. It's about, about uh, 30 million. And uh, the, uh, uh, it's World Bank and also WHO has estimates about 10% of the population belongs to persons with disabilities. But as per the uh, longitudinal and aging study in India, Lassi report says that India has about 43% of the elderly, uh, above the 60, sorry, 4.3% of the elderly, about 60 and above, have been using or need of assistive uh, technologies, approximately about 60 million population. 
and of course rata study in india in 2021 found that the prevalence of need for assisted products was about 24.5% across of all age groups uh, uh, of the study population about 3 uh, 50 million uh, indians are in need of assistive technologies and uh, Uh, as a uh, can you yeah thanks uh, as per the who estimations of the global level about uh, 2.5 billion people globally who need at least one assistive products including uh, spectacles uh, and and about 900 million who need other or more assistive products than uh, spectacles and by 2050 it is estimated that need for assistive products in the global Uh, population is estimated to increase to 3.55 billion with spectacles and 1.3 billion without spectacles uh, needed assistive devices currently 9 out of 10 people who need assistive product technology do not have access uh, to it which has been adversely impacting their education livelihood health and well-being of the individuals not only individuals but also families and entire community Uh, that is really need uh, uh, the, the attention of the global policy maker taking this advantage of course can you go for next slide please india has come out with a national strategic framework to make india as a global leader first regional leader as well as the global leader of assistive technologies by 2047 when india is going to uh, uh, complete 100 years of independence can you make the change of the slide please for others viewers so okay vision see uh, people in india and beyond can access to appropriate high quality affordable assistive technologies when they need it and close to where they live it this is the vision of assistive technology framework and also we have a mission to make india as a global hub of assistive technologies because we have all needed uh, industry investments and also innovations happening around the uh, country with our allied educational and research and innovation institutions and startup ecosystem which we have uh, next slide please okay the approach the approach of the entire national strategic framework is to people centered market oriented approach focusing on four p's that is that they are product with uh, provision and also building the personal and the policy ecosystem the focus is on overall is towards the people's well being next slide please the objectives or the goal uh for the national strategic framework framework is that to ensure conducive and comprehensive policy ecosystem for assistive technology industry and service to flourish while ensuring its equitable access to all who need it in india and also beyond india we have the objective for the second objective is products where to establish india as a leading global manufacturer and sub exporter of assistive products to meet the demand in india and also beyond india again the provisions adequate provisions needs to be made to implement in india as a model of assistive technology provision as an integral component of universal health coverage and expand the model beyond india uh, to the borders like neighboring countries and all personal of course we you all know that india is the second populated country in the world with the need skilling reskilling and upskilling human resources to be the leading global supplier of quality human resources for assistive technology services 
while catering to the domestic demand. Next slide, please. Well, we have certain challenges as we all know that India is a developing country, but within the, this scope, we have certain challenges like fragmented market where the including the professional user groups, funding and provision mechanism and multiple access pathway, pathways is the one of the challenge. And of course, the second is the linear and cost in intensive market hampering the scalability. Of course, inadequate policies and plans for improving access to assistive technologies. Of course, at the uh, developing nations is another challenge. Of course, within this, we keeping the main objective, we have certain like low priority at policy level uh, due to lack of awareness and understanding about the role of purpose and potential of assistive technology services. Again, the limited funding at all levels, you know that the developing countries are not focusing on invest more major investments. This is another challenge which we are facing. And of course, limited data uh, uh, on needs for the, these services, assistive products, like who needs what, the limited data is there. And of course, inadequate co convergence among various uh, departments in the developing countries, especially that departments focusing on disability, department focusing on technology, innovations, all these barriers are there. The, the object, uh, next slide, please. So to address all these barriers and challenges, we have developed a strategies to, uh, to ensure these challenges are addressed in a rapid way and see that the people, uh, we, India can become a global leader and people can have access to assistive products. Well, the strategy one is like to reinforce governance and leadership uh, for the progressive realization of the universal assistive technology, uh, assistive technology con coverage. We have identified about 19 priority action points and also we have mapped the stakeholders in India at the national government as well as at the uh, regional or provincial governments. So that, that, that is there and of course, the create a dynamic and demand driven market ecosystem uh, for assistive technologies services uh, to flourish in the social non-profit private for profit and as a public sector towards the shared goal of making India as a global uh, hub of assistive technologies. Uh, we have mapped again the concerned central ministries, union ministries and also the states and other stakeholders who are involved in investments, in innovations and also, re, uh, and also industry, promoting industry. Next slide. And with regard to the products, when it comes to the products, we have certain challenges, especially the objective to fulfill the objective to that, to establish India as a leading uh, global manufacturers, like uh, the inadequate product range, because the products required for the, the uh, persons with disabilities ranges from the, uh, at various ranges, like WHO have, might have identified about 100 plus products, but similarly in India, we have identified about 300 products where uh, different types of assistive devices which are really needed by the people with disabilities and also elderly of course the people with chronic disorders and all so limited procurement and supply as of now it is a limited product uh, procurements are happening and some certain products of course we uh, procure from japan singapore and european nations and other countries so that the pro assistive products cost very high uh, especially the middle income families for the lower income families. That we want to make sure this challenge how we can address uh, by uh, providing affordable assistive devices and inadequate local evidence of the effectiveness and cost effectiveness products, technologies and working uh, the met uh, methods is various. So that too, this is another challenge which we are facing and relatively ineffective regulatory mechanism. As of now, there is uh, ineffective me uh, regulatory mechanism that need that this, this this strategic framework is addressing and of course limited support to long-term research uh, this is another challenge which we are facing of course limited awareness among uh, the sp Murinachuk, i just need to let you know you have one minute left in your presentation apologies for interrupting you if, if that's okay one minute left thank you right thank you i then i'll, I'll just move on uh, to the strategies i'll focus on the strategies which we have include and then the capacity for larger scale manufacturing 
Of course, uh, leverage resources and systems. Uh, we have uh, incorporated about uh, uh, several 16 and 11. Demand driven consumer uh, centric market for AT sector, both in India and beyond. And also, of course, strategies to achieve the objective three, that is, uh, the, the assistive technology to be made part of the universal healthcare. As of now, this is not there in many countries, including in India, that we have made it as a, uh, the assistive technology as a universal healthcare, improve the access to AT services uh, through innovative strategies for the provision of AT, include AT as an integral part of national disaster preparedness and response plans. Uh, this is uh, another strategy which we have adapted. Of course, provision for assistive technology as an integral part of universal health coverage is uh, considered. And uh, to achieve the objective four, uh, build institutional and organizational capacities, which is lacking in many developing countries, and including India, and ensure quality prospectors and support to human resources in AT sector, like building the skills, reskilling, and all. Uh, of course, uh, thank you so much for giving me these opportunities. We'll see that how the Zero Project can also collaborate and make sure that the products of India can be a global leader. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, SP Ranyachu. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's heartening to hear about. <laughs> if, we, if you just mute your online, can you mute online? <laughs> It's so, not so heartening to hear me speaking back at myself. Okay? Okay. Th thank you, SB. So, um, we've heard from India from the point of view of what they're doing in developing a national assistive technology framework. We do have a little bit of time for maybe one question. So, I'm going to be calling soon on Dan Rachel from Israel. But before Dan comes in with this question uh, for SB Murachu, couple of little points if, if those who are speaking in the room could speak very slowly to make sure our interpreters and our sign language experts are able to pick up on exactly what you're saying so if we could just slow down and then secondly please don't worry the content of all your presentations will be available online as well so we will have the benefit of everything that you've prepared for us so we really do appreciate that so Dan from you could we maybe take your question that you might want to pose to SB Muniratu yeah, hi. Uh, by which criteria or key figures will the set goals of being a regional leader by 2030 or a global leader by 2047 be actually evaluated? So if we have SB Muniratu, have you, have you picked up on that question? Yes, of course. Uh, the, the complete map, mapping of AT needs in India and also beyond India uh, that that we have uh, uh, focusing and they considered as a priority for fulfilling their, uh, their the requirements by 2030 for the regional uh, requirements and that is the target we have incorporated and of course we are working on it and the assessment and fulfilling the global global demand uh, for assistive technologies by establishing ecosystem uh, of innovation industry and investments. So these criteria we have adapted to assess the requirements and also fulfilling the aspirations of the people of disability. Thank you very much uh, to Dan, but also to SB Moniratu for responding there as well. Okay, we're now moving to Ireland, and it's my honour now to welcome Anne Rabbit, Minister of State, Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration. And Anne Rabbit, the Minister, is representing the Government of Ireland and will be addressing us now on what's called the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act 2015. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cahal, and thank you very much, everybody, and good afternoon, and thank you for the invite here this afternoon. I assume there's somebody doing my slide deck as I go along. All right. So it's my pleasure to be with you today and to present on a historic piece of Irish legislation, the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act 2015. As Minister of State with responsibility for disability, I am particularly grateful for the chance to contribute today alongside so many other representatives of governments and organisations from around the world. 
To begin with the assisted decision making legislation, so we'll just move to slide two, please. So to begin with the assisted decision making legislation is hugely important in the context of Irish history as it will replace legislation. Oh, sorry, I have to do it myself, right? Uh, as it will replace legislation that preceded the formation of the Irish state. Importantly, it will bring wardships to end in the state, a regime which has been in place since 1871. One which limits a person's capacity to control their own lives. Wardship is a system of absolute substitute decision making, where a person's decisions are made for them by a court appointed a third party. Now, I just want to make sure I'm on the right slides. It, it is a similar to what might be referred to as particularly disempowering guardianship or conservation ship in other jurisdictions. Ultimately, wardship is a disempowering system that places a third party's assessment of a person's best interest above the person's own will and preference. As you can imagine, this reform is long overdue. All wards of courts in Ireland will exit wardship within three years of commencement of the Assisted Decision Making Act. I have no doubt that the assisted decision making will bring about positive changes in the lives of many Irish people. The proposed legislation will give people experiencing uh, diminished capacity greater power to direct the course of their own lives in an independent and dignified manner. This new approach changes the existing law on capacity from the status approach of the wardship system to a more flexible approach whereby capacity is assessed on an issue and time-specific basis. When I say status approach to capacity, I mean the approach under wardship where once a person is found to lack capacity, um, is found to lack legal capacity in one context, are deemed to lack capacity in all contexts. When I say that the new legislation will move towards a better approach, I refer to an approach where capacity is assumed in the first instance and where the burden of proof rests on rebutting that presumption and where a person's capacity is assessed based on the individual decision in question and only at that point in time that this decision can, is to be made. Central to the Act is the importance of enshrining respect for the will and preference of persons who may lack capacity, maximising their ability to affect decisions in everyday lives. All decision supporters under the Act must respect and follow the will and purse preference of persons who have lost capacity. Thank you. So the assisted decision making legislation will provide for a new model of supported decision making to replace wardship. This new model will introduce tiered decision making supports for persons who may lack capacity to make certain decisions in their lives. As part of the tiered system, there are five formal decision support arrangements available under the Act. Two of these are for the purpose of advance planning, including the making of advanced directives for healthcare and treatment decisions. These are based on the level of support a person requires to make specific decisions at a specific time. These tiers will ensure that the right level of support is available to persons lacking capacity at the right time. A suite of new administrative processes and support measures are currently being put in place to ensure the proper implementation of the legislation. A new service, the Decision Support Service, is being established to operate many of the provisions of the Act. The Decision Support Service will allow persons to put in place decision supporters when they need them and will maintain panels of experts to act as a decision supporters where a person might not be able to afford one. This service will also hold an important oversight role in relation to active support arrangements, ensuring that decision supporters appointed on the Act are appropriately supervised.
The Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act 2015 has yet to be commenced. However, the full commencement of this legislation is planned for the near future. It will be at this point that the Decision Support Services becomes fully operational at the, and the appointment of decision supporters under the, legal, under the Act will begin. Amendments to the Act have been required before full commencement can take place. My department has brought these amendments to the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Amendment Act 2022, which addresses a number of issues identified as part of the original commencement process. Many of the amendments will streamline processes in the interest of those using the Act and provide for an, interested, an increased role of the Director of the Decision Support Services in terms of developing material, handling complaints and overseeing decision supporters. The amending legislation will also help to improve safeguards for those making decisions, support arrangements and further enshrines the concept of will and preference within the Act. A new two-step process for enduring power of attorney is also being introduced, which will allow a person to make and register an EPA when the person has capacity to do so and may change at any time prior to the EPA coming into force. Additionally, this allows for additional layers of safeguards to be introduced in the overall EPA process. Sorry, I should pass that. Right. Amendments also provide for the introduction of temporary prohibition orders, which will allow the decision support service to make an application to court to suspend a decision supporter from making decisions on behalf of a person. The emergency action is considered necessary to safeguard the interests of person lacking capacity and their assets where required. Improved and more flexible complaint mechanisms will allow the decision support service to informally resolve certain complaints without the need to refer to the courts. This is seen as an important, not only in terms of streamlining the complaints process, but also in preventing complaints unnecessarily ending up in court and clogging up through the system. Amendments have also sought to reduce and simplify capacity assessments under the Act, with a range of healthcare professionals being permitted to undertake these assessments. And this is seen as critical in reducing the burden on vulnerable persons applying for decision supports, particularly against a backdrop of increased safeguards under the Act. As referred to in an earlier slide, all wards of court in Ireland will exit wardship within a three-year period. And as part of this process, each of their cases will be reviewed by a wardship court. And as part of the amendments to the Act, free legal... Well, I might be female. I, 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 I sometimes act like a male. <laughs> Outside of the changes to the assisted decision making, we have used. And I just. That's, all right, there I have it. Outside of the changes to the assisted decision making, we have also used the amending legislation to further Ireland's commitment under the UNCRPD. A national monitoring body, the Irish Human Rights Equality Commission, has been appointed with a remit to promote and monitor the implementation of the UNCRPD in Ireland. This body will play a crucial role in ensuring that we as a state follow through on our UNCRPD commitments. Amendments will also remove existing prohibitions on certain persons with disability from serving on jurors to ensure that persons who have the capacity to act as a juror are supported to do so. A prohibition on persons of unsound mind from being elected to the Irish Parliament has also been removed. The commencement of the Amendment Act will see Ireland ratify the Hague Convention on the International Protection of Adults, which will usher in a new area of cooperation between Ireland and other convention countries, ensuring that vulnerable adults are protected across international borders. The amending legislation also sets ambitious targets for public bodies in relation to the employment of persons with disabilities. 
doubling the current statutory target from 3% to 6%. These targets were developed during the drafting and the developing of the Comprehensive Employment Strategy for People with Disabilities 2015 to 2025 and have a basis in objective analysis having regard to the existing statistical data on the employment of persons with disabilities. Thank you all once again for the invitation allowing me to participate and if I frustrated you with the slides, I apologise. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And you, you, you absolutely did not, Minister. Um, and just to congratulate you and thank you for your input. Um, we do have time for one further exploratory question um, because this is such an important piece of legislation and an act that has far-reaching consequences that maybe other member states could consider. Because you spoke about the importance of seeing it being, you know, the starting point being that you assume capacity for the individual, but also that there are supports for individuals where capacity might not be there, and it's very much regulated and set out very clearly. One further exploratory question just for you, Minister, is the, there is a transition phase um, to put this into full um, operational terms. So the transition is to take place over, we think, a period of three years. Just some questions might be, is the change to be made in application and by whom, and what happens if existing legal guardians refuse to waive their rights? Thank you, Carl, for, for the question. And let me explain and tease that out a little bit further. So the Act provides uh, that all current wards of court must have exited wardship within a period of three years from commencement. There are two ways in which this can happen. Firstly, the ward of court, or indeed a committee of the ward which has a guardianship type role, may apply directly to the wardship court for review of the ward's case. Secondly, if an application is not made for a review of the person's wardship, the wardship court will automatically schedule a review within the three-year period. And a core part of the review will be an assessment of the person's capacity, which will determine what supports the persons require following their exit from wardship and the ward could be found to have full capacity which would see the person simply exit wardship with their assets returned to them. More likely the ward will have their assets returned and exit wardship with either a co-decision maker or a decision making representative appointed depending on the level of support that's required to them. I hope that explains it. It does indeed, Minister, and thank Great you for that further clarification. Thank you, Minister. Okay, our next presentation now moves to Singapore, so I'm delighted to thank welcome you. Eric Chua, who's Senior Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Social and Family Development and representing the Government of Singapore. And Eric will be talking to us about the amendment to the Compulsory Education Act 2000. So the floor is now with you, Eric. Thank you very much. Just want to check if everybody can hear me well. We can indeed. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Wonderful. Distinguished Chairperson, Ms. Daniela Bass, moderators, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen, Singapore is honoured to participate in the Policymaker Forum today. The Zero Project has contributed to advancing the rights of persons with disabilities through its network and conferences. We value this opportunity to engage our fellow speakers and learn from your wealth of experience. So I'd like to express first my appreciation to the Zero, Zero Project, including co-moderator and Zero Project CEO, Mr. Michael Fembeck, and the organizers of the conference for facilitating this process. I look forward to a fruitful discussion with everyone. Next slide, please. Madam Chair, Singapore is committed to implementing the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD, and building an inclusive society where persons with disabilities are enabled to pursue their aspirations, achieve the potential, and participate as equal, integral, and contributing members of society. We also recognize the importance of achieving the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, including SDG 4, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for everyone. A quality education accessible to all is one of the key steps in achieving other goals, especially SDG 8, to promote productive, inclusive employment, SDG 10, on reducing inequalities, and SDG 5, on achieving gender equality. Our efforts to achieve the SDGs and fully implement the Convention are guided by our national roadmaps called 
the enabling master plans. We refresh our enabling master plans every few years through a process driven collectively by representatives from the disability community, the private sector, and the government. These long-term plans guide the efforts of the government, people, and private sectors towards inclusion in line with our international commitments. Next slide, please. Madam Chair, Singapore firmly believes that all children, including children with disabilities, must have access to an education that develops their full potential and equips them to participate meaningfully in society. To achieve this, we passed the Compulsory Education Act in 2000 to help give every child a common core of knowledge to provide a firm foundation for further education and common school experiences that encourages social cohesion. The underpinning belief in the, in the Compulsory Education Act is that education helps provide each child a good foundation that one can build on to develop one's potential to the fullest. Singapore's education system adopts a differentiated approach to meet the diverse needs of students with or without disabilities. As far as possible, we support students with disabilities in our mainstream schools. However, to ensure that students are availed the best learning environment and teaching methods catering to their needs, those who may require specialized and more intensive intervention are taught in spe special education or SPAT schools through a customized curriculum that helps them attain the skills necessary for further education, training, employment, and independent living. Next slide, please. When the Act was passed in 2000, children with disabilities were exempted from compulsory education because it was initially thought that the inclusion of children with disabilities might be unduly harsh on them. But we have since moved further on this position. In 2016, we extended compulsory education to all children with disabilities born after 1st of January 2012 to ensure that all children of schooling age have access to education. Doing this underscored the importance for children with disabilities to have quality, accessible and affordable education so that they too can achieve their fullest potential. We also invested in raising the quality, accessibility and affordability of our SPAT schools in Singapore. We increased the number of school, school place placements so that children who might need a, a place in an appropriate SPAT school could enroll in a timely fashion. We provide financial assistance to all who need, need it and keep school fees affordable within heavy subsidies from the government and funding contributions from the community. We continue to work with disability organisations running the SPAT schools on an ongoing basis to ensure the professional development of school staff, especially teachers, as well as the effective and quality implementation of our teaching and learning syllabi. Today, under the Compulsory Education Act, about 80% of around 35,000 students with disabilities and special education needs are supported in mainstream schools. This includes almost all students with physical and sensory impairments. The remaining 20% or 7,500 students are supported in special education schools. Singapore remains committed to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals and implementing the CRPD in our local context to build an inclusive Singapore. We have implemented a range of initiatives under the first three enabling master plans and have started implementing new plans and initiatives under the current Enabling Master Plan 2030. We recently launched the Enabling Academy, and this was in last May, a disability learning hub that promotes lifelong learning for persons with disabilities. We have also expanded the range of government-funded early intervention services for preschool age children with developmental needs, enhanced subsidies to keep fees affordable, and substantially increase our investment in early intervention services. There's no doubt that there's still more to be done on our journey to build a more inclusive society, and we are committed to doing so, not just to honour our commitments under the CRPD, but more importantly, to value and support every person with a disability is an imperative for us as we seek to build a more caring and inclusive society in Singapore. We look forward to engage and learn from everyone for the rest of today. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Eric, um, and for your overview of what Singapore is doing to ensure a more inclusive and affordable and accessible education system. It's very impressive to hear what you have to say. We have time now for one further exploratory question, so I'm going to ask Immaculada Palencia Pereira from the EU to ask a further question. Thank you, Immaculada. Um, yes, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I think it's great that uh, now um, education is also compulsory for children with disabilities. But that brings me to the question on um, how inclusive that special education settings are and um, how uh, inclusive the mainstream education is to allow to keep uh, children with disabilities in these mainstream schools. Thank you very much for the great, great question, Immaculada. I think um, Singapore's goal for students with disabilities is to enable each student to really maximize the potential and lead an independent and, and really meaningful life in society. So we adopt a differentiated approach, as I mentioned earlier as well, in providing each child a quality educational setting that can best serve their needs. Now, parents can make informed decisions based on the advice of professionals who have observed or work with the child to consider the most educationally appropriate setting that best needs, meets the needs of the child. Now, to facilitate in interaction opportunities between special education and mainstream students, meaningful joint activities are sustained and organized between school using school partnerships between SPAT schools as well as mainstream schools. Now, these partnerships include camps, learning journeys, co-curricular activities and encourage the development of competencies that are much needed for the 21st century. But they also offer students in mainstream schools the context to appreciate how their peers in special education are differently able and encourage the development of values such as patience and kindness. Both groups of students come to appreciate diversity and to develop empathy as part of the process. And as part of a whole school approach in mainstream schools, support for students with disabilities is provided through inclusive classroom practices by all teachers, guided by key personnel that oversees the case management team alongside teachers trained in special needs and dedicated school-based personnel. They coordinate intervention programs and support services for students with disabilities in their respective schools, which include programs that leverage peer support to ensure that mainstream schools remain inclusive, safe, and accommodating for students with disabilities. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, Michael, for the question, and to Eric as well. Thank you very much for the clarification. So now we're moving to a representative of the International Telecommunications Union. So I'm delighted to have in the room here Masiato Konmore, who's rapporteur of Q28, which is the Multimedia Framework for eHealth Applications in study group 16. That's quite a mouthful. But succinctly, this is a really important piece because I know you've been working a lot with the WHO and this relates very much to how e-health can help benefit people and certainly after the pandemic and the implications of the pandemic, this is extremely important and we have a lot to learn from this. So the floor is over to you now. Thank you very much, Chair. And um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, it's my great honor to be here and to present WHO ITU's uh, Joint Global Standard for Accessibility to Telehealth. And um, the slide uh, shows two documents. On, on the left is actually the recommendation from ITU. And on the right is the front page of the WHO publication, which is a twin text. They're, they have uh, the same information, but uh, published by two United Nations agencies. So uh, I'd like to move on to the next uh, slide. Okay. So as everyone knows, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the digitalization of society with a quantum leap. So many companies have accelerated the digitalization of their business operations by, by some statistics, by three to four years, sometimes 10 years. And many companies uh, believe that they will stay the way it is. They, they do not go back to old normal, but they will uh, take up this new normal. 
And uh, this is also true, especially in the t healthcare um, area. So at the beginning of 2020, uh, digital strategy initiatives around telehealth and digitalization were something nice to have. But uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic has made it uh, absolutely essential for healthcare because of the physical distance that is required. And uh, this will stay uh, for the next uh, year. So uh, this is because this is the, the only, uh, at a certain point, this is the only uh, viable solution for telehealth. But this is a double-edged, especially for a double-edged sword for persons with disabilities. Uh, they're potentially the most vulnerable people as the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, said clearly that uh, it is the vulnerable segment of the people that are most severely affected, in particular those with disabilities because of this uh, COVID-19. So um, these are the challenges for persons with disabilities in access to telehealth services. And uh, one of the, the big obstacles is the lack of standard because there are proprietary solutions that are not accessible, which are used uh, by the industry, healthcare industry. So as the United Nations Agency of ICT, uh, Information Communication Technology, International Telecommunication Union, ITU, has started collaboration with WHO on accessible telehealth. And in order to provide a set of requirements on technical requirements on accessible telehealth, ITU and WHO organized workshops, conferences, meetings to collect challenges and needs of persons with disabilities in telehealth service uh, areas. And these challenges vary from, uh, from person to person and depending on the type of disability or impairment they have and the nature of the digital platform or devices used in the tele telehealth service. And WHO and ITU try to formulate technical requirements intended to meet those various uh, challenges and needs for persons with disabilities. And this is the development process. We started in the year 2020, and we uh, adopted the terms of reference. And then we started out with uh, uh, evidence gathering for challenges and needs of persons with disabilities. And then we had a um, civil society seminar. And also, uh, we also invited industry companies, uh, uh, telehealth service providers to workshop as well as um, uh, in between, we had many meetings uh, with ITU and WHO. And our final draft um, was published, I think, in um, late 2021. And then there was an editorial process and also approval process among the member states, 193 or 94 uh, United Nations nation states. Uh, to member states, and then we agreed on the text, and the the final version from WHO was published in June 2022. So it took about two years to develop this standard. So what does it have? Um, this standard, as I said, collects requirements, technical requirements for persons with disabilities in the situations of uh, telemedicine as well as telehealth. And uh, telehealth platforms, uh, for example, uh, I, uh, I can give you two examples of the requirements. The first one is telehealth platforms should be compatible with assistive devices like screen readers or braille keyboards. So this is one example of a requirement that is important for persons with visual impairment. And another example is 
remote sign language interpretation or video remote interpretation, VRI, system should be implemented and made available to persons who are deaf and hard of hearing as a standard part of telehealth services. So this is very important for persons with um, hearing problems as well as deaf people. And as you can see on the left, uh, I have put up a photograph that shows this kind of situation where video remote interpretation is given by um, a sign language interpreter remotely so that the, the doctor can talk with the deaf person remotely. And, uh, and also we can provide uh, captioning so that a hard of hearing person who doesn't use sign language can also communicate with the, with the doctor or medical practitioners. So uh, uh, these are some of the requirements that we collected. We also collected requirements for uh, mentally as well as cognitively, intellectually uh, disabled people as well as uh, mobility uh, disabled people. And uh, we also collected requirements for security. This is very important because of the, 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 the nature of the information that you carry. And also we uh, provided some requirements during the planning phase, uh, not just on the telehealth um, consultation phase, but before the, the actual consultation takes place, they need to provide accessibility as well. For example, uh, arranging a meeting with a doctor. And um, this standard, uh, standard is something that is not just for publication. Uh, standard has to be implemented and they have to be adopted and they have to be used. And for that purpose, uh, these requirements are intended for adoption by member states as regulations or legislation and should also be voluntarily implemented by healthcare professionals and manufacturers, healthcare service providers, in short, the industry of healthcare. And if implemented, uh, this is a great potential to support accessible and equ equitable uh, delivery of healthcare services, especially in this age of ICT, information communication technology, is an essential tool now for uh, telehealth area as well. So that's uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much for that presentation. I think we can all agree the importance of this innovation. And maybe one further uh, exploratory question might be, getting the telehealth kind of industry on board to implement this, what's your sense in terms of how we can encourage it? Should we be incentivizing? Should member states be incentivizing? Or should there be sanctions? Should we be regulating this area? What's your perspective? Well, I think um, ideally, there should be some uh, legis legislation or regulation uh, to invite, at least voluntarily, to implement this. Because, as I said, there's a security issue involved and also privacy issues and so on. So, for example, in Europe, there, uh, there's an issue of GDPR. So, um, and, um, so the information has to be protected in a proper way. And also the accessibility should be provided in the right way. So uh, for that purpose, I think, uh, for example, in Europe, I think uh, because of the um, European uh, Accessibility Act, uh, for example, alongside with that, uh, this can be part of the regulation. And not only that, not only in Europe, but uh, also uh, globally, uh, I th I, that'll be a good idea because otherwise, um, uh, industry may not be interested in providing this kind of uh, uh, service, accessible service. Thank you. Thank you, Masahito. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to hand you to Michael because um, you are all familiar with the phrase, there is no such thing as a free lunch. So not only do I have to moderate, I also have to speak to you. So I'm now going to hand you to Michael to introduce me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have to switch your heads symbolically. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Sir Kel Morgan policy advisor, rehabilitation health service 
assistive technology and disability inclusion of the World Health Organization Regional Office uh, to Europe. So, Kel, it's your turn to present now. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. So, um, we're now going to move to um, very much the core health agenda, um, and this is in the context of making sure that we have inclusive health systems in the context of persons with disabilities. So, I'm going to present on what's called the WHO European Framework for Action to Achieve the Highest Attainable Standard of Health for Persons with Disabilities. And this is a framework that was adopted by all of the member states in the European region. So when I talk about Europe, I'm not talking about the European Union, I'm talking about 53 member states, including the European Union, but also stretching right into um, uh, Central Asia as well. So it's a very significant region with um, a significant level of interest in this area. Minister, you'll have to show me how to use this clicker now, just to... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so what I want to talk a little bit about is what the framework is about and what, what is it that the member states um, are committing to. So the framework is very much concerned with trying to address from a health perspective what we see as being the experience of structural disadvantages, including increased poverty rates. We know there's a very clear connection between the experience the lived experience of disability and persons being excluded from the labour market from being disadvantaged also including from a poverty perspective. We also know, and this was a very significant issue um, uh, particularly during the pandemic, that persons with disabilities do face every day in their lives access barriers to healthcare um, and whilst it was great to see what Masahito had talked about, we just see to see a lot more um, being done in terms of making sure that we can remove barriers um, for persons with disabilities when it comes to accessing services. And we also know that persons with disabilities do experience higher levels of unmet healthcare needs and that health outcomes um, tend to become worse as a result of not getting access to uh, levels of health and social care services as well. And also that only half of persons with disabilities can afford um, healthcare. So affordability in relation to healthcare more globally um, is a significant concern for member states. So building on the World Health Assembly resolution, which is all the states that are members of the World Health Assembly have actually agreed a resolution on this very sensitive and important topic around the highest attainable standard of health for persons with disabilities. So that resolution tries to address issues around the need to establish action towards eliminating barriers to accessing healthcare accessing good quality and timely and affordable healthcare services for persons with disabilities as being a right. And then also that health is a crucial aspect to quality of life and well-being, and that disability discrimination needs to be eliminated, particularly in the context of health service provision. So in, in the Euro region, um, across the 53 member states, we actually took that resolution and we did some work on, well, what does that mean in operational terms? How do you actually action it? So how do you move from a statement to what do you need to do to achieve the resolution itself? And this is the framework for action to achieve the highest attainable standard of health for persons with disabilities, which brings us from 2022 up to 2030. So this is recognizing and responding to the size of the population of persons with disabilities in the European region. It's responding again to this issue around unmet healthcare needs and reducing health inequalities. It's saying what we need to do across the 53 member states to implement the actual resolution itself. And it is very much recognized and related to the UN Sustainable Development Goal number three, which is about ensuring healthy lives. And it is, which is important from our perspective, whilst it's a resolution and a framework, we do know that in particular Article 25, which is the right of a person to enjoy health under the UN Convention, this is actually a practical guide, a practical steps and actions that member states can take to ensure that Article 25 is fully realizable. So what is our vision? Our collective vision, it's not the WHO vision, it's all our vision in the, in the region, is that by 2030, full inclusion in healthcare planning, delivery and leadership across the region will be achieved. And we have four distinct objectives. One is to eliminate discrimination. Secondly, to promote health and well-being. 
Thirdly, to elaborate disability inclusive policies and plans. And finally, and importantly, to build evidence base on disability and health. And we're doing this again, referring back to the UN Convention, very much on the basis of the principles of it being an equity-based focus, putting the person at the center of the process, and that we use data, we use information to inform the effectiveness of our policies. So our approaches are very much a rights-based approach, taking into account the fundamental importance of having universal design, eliminating barriers in all aspects, and very much the life course approach. So when it comes to each and every one of us, we will all experience at some stage in our life, from, from cradle to grave, we will all experience some kind of impact on our capacity to function. So it's in all of our interests to work towards trying to achieve this. So how are we going to do it? So this goal is to provide a framework for action that will lead to disability inclusive health systems and the promotion of health and well-being of persons with disabilities of all ages and across all contexts in the European region. And you can see here set out before you that there are four objectives, which I've explained previously, so I won't dwell on each one of them again. I also want to draw attention to the range of actions that we are saying that the member states have agreed to sign up to under each of these objectives. And you'll be delighted to know I won't read out each and every one of them because this presentation will be available to you. But when it comes to eliminating disability discrimination, you can see that there are a range of actions that we have all agreed if we can implement and work together and collaborate, that actually we will have gone a very long way to addressing the issue of discrimination and barriers to accessing healthcare, whether that to be do with attitudinal physical communication concerns, right up to providing services via telemedicine and through community-based networks. In other words, can we make our services to the greatest possible extent accessible to all persons, regardless of their level of functioning? Secondly, the objective is to promote the health and well-being of persons with disabilities. So there are five distinct actions you can see there, which is about introducing strategies and practical mechanisms to ensure coordination, right up to introducing or strengthening legislation and policies. So Minister Rabbit had talked about how Ireland is approaching the need to legislate for and protect persons' rights when it comes to decision-making about everyday um, our everyday lives and so that's a clear example of what Ireland is doing in this field. Also providing adequate financial resources to ensure the provision of sexual and pre pre reproductive health initiatives um, and access to good quality sexual health education as well. I've put objectives three and four together um, and objective three is very much ensuring that there are disability inclusive approaches to health emergencies. We know from the pandemic, and including today's lived experience when it comes to conflict, very often persons who may not be able to speak for themselves or do not have a voice are sometimes forgotten when it comes to these crises. And certainly we've experienced that during the pandemic. However, there have been lots of examples where governments, where state agencies, where NGOs have taken very specific steps to ensure that persons with disabilities are actively included in planning for and implementing the response um, where an emergency takes place. And we have examples again from an Irish perspective during COVID where in the planning for, for services for people with disabilities, NGOs, disability rights advocates and persons with disabilities were actively involved, I can tell you, uh, from the perspective of making sure that the services we were delivering were in the most difficult of circumstances included persons with disabilities in planning for those services. From the perspective of objective four, um, we're saying that you have to have a very strong evidence base to understand whether these actions that we're taking actually are making a difference and to plan for services into the future. So we will be working with member states to ensure that in each of the member states that we have a specific focus on measuring the effectiveness of these actions that we're taking, that we will support member states in developing data that tells us whether we have inclusive health systems, whether we are encouraging and participating and making sure that people in a leadership capacity are included in the planning and delivery of services as well. So in terms of next steps, 
um, we, in the framework, have included a particular section on governance and accountability because we all, in our lifetime, I'm sure, have been experienced in overloaded with policy ambitions, very high uh, ambitions to implement policies, but maybe poor on implementation, and not thinking through what governance and accountability do we need to have in place to make sure that we do actually action what we say we will do. So from the framework perspective, all the member states and the WHO Regional Office for Europe have agreed a number of important steps to support each other in implementing this actual framework. So there will be a high-level advisory council established. There is a commitment from the WHO um, in Europe to support member states in um, collating and disseminating and analysing data to do with disability inclusion. We will be actively promoting partnerships from the context of, of Europe. We work very closely with the European Disability Forum. We work very closely within member states with individual advocacy organisations. And that we will support member states in actually having a action, national action plan that takes the framework and brings it towards implementation. It's like the old adage, fail to plan, plan to fail. So this framework we're saying is really important um, in assisting member states in achieving their overall ambitions to be fully UNCRPD compliant. We will be having specific intervals where we'll be measuring the success or otherwise of the framework. For example, in, in the midterm report will be produced in 2026, and there will be a final monitoring report in 2030 as well. And then you can see also that the Regional Office for Europe, the WHO, will provide a midterm report to the Regional Committee at its 76th session in 2026. And we will have a monitoring and evaluation framework as well in place to make sure that what we are doing is transparent and that what we say we want to do, we try to deliver and support each other in doing. And this gathering here is another example where we're working together to learn off each other because no one member state, no one agency has the totality of the answer here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cale, for this uh, important and, uh, and forward-looking uh, framework. And I, I personally especially like the, the evidence base and the, the data focus of, uh, of this framework. We got time for more and one more brief question, and uh, I'd like to over to hand uh, over to, uh, to, to Dan from, from Israel. Thank you. Um, yeah, what formal and substantive strength do resolutions and actions plans have in the sense that they have uh, the ability to pave the way, create awareness, or do they also have, uh, in addition, power to legislate? Thank you, Dan. I think the first thing to say is that this is a resolution that um, has been adopted by all of the 53 member states, and indeed it's a resolution that relates to all the member states of the World Health Assembly as well. Whilst it doesn't have a legal binding, I would make a very clear point that what we have set out in the framework is very closely aligned to and actually sets out a pathway within which member states can achieve full compliance with the CRPD. So I would make a very strong connection between the framework and the legally binding um, um, actions that member states and the articles that all member states have taken up under the convention, which is legally binding. And secondly, we would see it as being a way or a method in which member states can achieve the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals as well. So we like to see this as something that the member states themselves, the consultation was very clear. Member states were the driving force behind developing the actions. It was very much an inclusive consultation process, including um, OPDs and DPOs. Um, and the final point I would make is, is that if we can embrace this, I think we can go a long, long way to achieve full compliance with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Thank you. Then. Thank you, Cale. And I'm handing back now the head from the, the chair from me to you, and you can announce your, the, the, the next uh, point on, in our, in our run-up, which, which, is, which is the video. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to show a very short video. Um, this video, I hope you will agree, um, is both heartwarming but also gives us a sense of hope. So the video relates to the resolution itself. Um, I'm introducing now uh, Yeppe and Jesper, who will talk about the importance of the resolution, 
But I think you'll also see, this is based in Denmark, you'll also see the importance of assistive technology and having access to personal assistance service and how that is fundamental to helping people achieve a good quality of life and helping people to um, um, ful fulfil their full potential. So if we could now, if the team could now play the video, thank you. Jeg hedder Jeppe, og jeg er 32. Jeg bor i Valby. Jeg har CP, fordi min mors livmoder sprang under fødslen, så jeg fik ikke lidt nok under fødslen. Jeg hedder Jesper, og jeg er Jeppes assistent, hjælper. Jeg er 32 år. Det er en, en ligge loft lift, som gør, at min øh, krop ikke bliver slidt. Og vi har selvfølgelig bilen, som gør, at Jeppe kan komme rundt og, og gøre de ting, han gerne vil. Det, han, han ville øh, være meget begrænset, hvis han ikke havde bilen i forhold til sine øh, fritidsaktiviteter, i forhold til at komme til, øh, til læge og til bank og så videre. Så bare til livet sådan noget. Jeg styrer den computer med mine øjne. Tobin helt vildt fantastisk hjælpemiddel, som øh, det kan slet ikke udtrykkes øh, nok, hvor, hvor meget den hjælper Jeppe til at kunne, kunne være selvstændig. Virkelig, altså den, den gør virkelig kommunikativt øh, og, og også til dels socialt, at du kan være selvstændig. Så han kan godt takke sin læge, han kan øh, sætte tider op med sin fysioterapeut, du kan selv gå på netbank. Han kan skrive med alle sine hjælpere over Facebook. Første, anden, tredje, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, R. Første, anden, tredje, mere. Første udgifter, mere udgifter. Kommunen, altså med, med den lovgivning der, det, det er vel dansk lovgivning, som siger, at man skal have, de, have adgang til de her midler og så videre for at kunne leve et liv på, på lige fod med andre. Så kommunen må, Jeppe siger, i bund og grund må kommunen ikke bruge økonomi som undskyldning for øh, ikke at bevilge øh, det, der bliver ansøgt om. Når jeg rejser, følger jeg mig fri. Alle er vildt nysgerrige på Jeppe, når vi er ude og rejse, og har lyst til at interagere med ham og snakke med ham. And my thanks to Jeppe and Jesper for participating in this. I hope you will have seen as an enriching um, presentation. So we're now moving on, okay? So our next presentation is from Canada. So I'm delighted to welcome Stephanie Cadu, who's in the, in the room here, who, and she's the Chief Accessibility Officer, and she's representing the Government of Canada. And we'll be talking about the Accessible Canada Act. The floor is yours, Stephanie. Thank you. I believe I need the uh, clicker for you. Uh, thank you, Cahal, for your introduction, and thank you to the Zero Project team. It's my honor to be here on behalf of Canada and to witness this uh, level of global leadership uh, in action. It, it reflects um, the incredible progress being made on accessibility around the world. Hello as well to everybody that's listening or watching online and thank you for your engagement. It's up to all of us to keep up the pressure uh, to help keep the need for a more accessible world top of mind for decision makers and legislators. And I'm so pleased today to be talking to you about the Accessible Canada Act. Uh, it's an important, powerful piece of legislation that may serve to inform other nations and policymakers and uh, gave rise uh, to my position. Uh, when the Accessible Canada Act was passed in 2019, we talked about it as the most significant legislative milestone 
for disability rights in Canada since the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was adopted in 1982. It also built or on the Canadian Human Rights Act and reflects Canada's commitments as a state party to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The act is significant because it represents a huge commitment from our government to eliminate barriers proactively and it puts the onus on systems to be proactive in doing so. Fundamentally, in Canada, we are working to change the way disability is perceived in society, for accessibility to be embraced as a valuable enhancement for our culture, not as a burden. We're working for nothing less than a cultural transformation, a mindset shift, and a serious society-wide reckoning with unconscious bias. The stakes are high. This legislation was developed with input from thousands of Canadians with disabilities from coast to coast to coast, including people with disabilities, advocacy organizations, and indigenous communities and organizations. More than 22% of Canadians, more than 6 million people, live with a disability, and our success will have a direct impact on the quality of their lives and their abilities to reach their fullest potential and contribute to society in meaningful, self-directed ways. The Act aims to create a barrier-free Canada by 2040, which is no small feat. It encompasses priority areas including employment, the built environment, ICT and other communications technologies, uh, communications overall, procurement, the design and delivery of programs and services, and transportation. Needless to say, success will require leadership and accountability at all levels of government and industry. It will also require ongoing input from people with disabilities because they will be the first to recognize what is working well and what is not working and needs more fine tuning. I am fortunate uh, to be playing a role in helping to ensure the act is successfully implemented. I act as an independent advisor to the Minister of Employment and Social Development who bears responsibility for the act. My role is unique in this regard because I am charged with, the viewing, with viewing implementation from a high level and reporting on the outcomes or lack of, if that, that shall be. My role will help to ensure that nothing is being missed and it provides another level of oversight. I can review the feedback that's coming in from across the country uh, and by doing this I may be able to identify themes or common issues as they emerge and identify possible solutions that could work for everyone. Along with my position, the Act also created the role of Accessibility Commissioner, responsible for enforcement through a variety of mechanisms, which will include penalties for non-compliance. And the Act created a new body called Accessibility Standards Canada, uh, and as the name suggests, they are responsible for developing new standards and regulations. But beyond this, the Act requires federal departments and federally regulated industries to take on accountability as well, and proactively seek to remove the barriers in their organizations. And that means a lot of different players are working towards the same goal. Access, uh, one of the key features of the Accessible Canada Act is, in fact, its requirement for organizations to prepare and publish accessibility plans that identify, remove, and prevent barriers in their policies, programs, practices, and services. These plans must be submitted to Canada's Accessibility Commissioner, must be updated every three years. The plans must also include a feedback process and regular progress reports must be published on the steps taken to implement the plans and, and feedback received. This includes reporting on feedback received and how it's being taken into account in the administration and updating of the plans. In December of 2022, the first of those plans were published with more to come later this year and the year following. Together with my team, I'm actively now renewing, reviewing those plans with the intent to, of being able to offer advice for future iterations. The Accessible Canada Act uh, governs federally regulated entities, but its main focus is on making systems responsible for proactively removing barriers and its potential to guide cultural change towards disability inclusion. It will serve as a model, I believe, for all levels of government, communities and sectors. People with disabilities have the right to greater equality, equity, and far more influence in shaping society. This stands to benefit all of us. 
because as we know, people with disabilities are often innovators by necessity, and the solutions that their insights and experience may provide are something that we, as a global collective, cannot afford to miss out on. In other words, I believe society cannot afford to accommodate inaccessibility any further. Once legislation exists, as it does now, and once policy has come into effect, we move from intent to action. Policy has to come to life and grapple with lived reality. And that's why consulting people with disabilities and the principle of nothing without us is so critical, as it will undoubtedly, uh, people with disabilities undoubtedly have experiences that even the most comprehensive plan may have missed. Ensuring that any feedback received is taken into account as plans are, out, plans are updated safeguards us against creating unintended outcomes. Myself, in my role, will be playing, paying close attention to the feedback that is coming in from people with disabilities across our country, because it's only with their input that we'll be able to continuously improve the way our policies are put into practice and experienced by those they are intended to benefit. These are still very early days for the Act, but we have momentum, and I look forward to discussing further and hearing questions uh, as we move forward. Thank you again for inviting me and, and Canada to be here to uh, participate in these very important culture-changing conversations. Thank you, Stephanie. Th thank you for, for representing Canada and talking about the Accessibility Act. We're actually, just to keep on time, to stay within our schedule, we're going to move to the next presentation, if that's okay. So I'm delighted now to represent, to take the representative from the European Union. So we have now Apologies, Maculada. So Maculada Placiencia Porero from the, EU, from the EU is now going to present on the European Union approach in relation to disability inclusion. So the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to present um, a very specific tool that we have, a legislative tool that we have adopted at European level, that is the European Accessibility Act. But first I'm going to explain you, and that is when this is a slide is, the framework in which we are operating now. We have um, currently uh, a strategy that aims to implement the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, where accessibility is really the first uh, key area of, um, of activities. This uh, strategy contains activities and actions in all areas um, of the articles of the conventions um, in uh, relation to um, uh, personal uh, rights, EU rights also, uh, free movement, for example, uh, in the Union, the quality of life, independent living. Um, we're talking about um, equal participation in non-discrimination, in education, in employment. And um, we have a section that it is about own delivery in which we uh, take initiatives uh, to, uh, for in relation to employees with, with disabilities, but also on uh, our own accessibility. We, with the strategy also, we are accountable for those activities and have some activities for monitoring and uh, for reporting, uh, together with some awareness raising. In the, in the uh, strategy, we have um, seven flagship initiatives, the first one being um, um, the creation of a platform in which we work together with member states' representatives, civil society, DPOs, and of course the Commission. Um, we have activities when uh, flagship for uh, labor uh, market improvement, um, a resource center on accessibility that I will be talking in the next presentation, <laughs> in the next uh, session, but uh, also so we are producing this year some guidance on independent living and um, a disability card, a disability card that will facilitate the mutual recognition of disability across the EU member states. Um, and also activities related to quality framework and um, uh, resources and strategies. Now, without, this is the framework in which we are operating, without more delay, I will go into the European Accessibility Act. 
Uh, and uh, here, what I would like to say is that the primary goal of European legislation on accessibility is to achieve equal access for persons with disabilities to products, to services, because that is the goal, that is the right that persons with disabilities have, equal access. Accessibility is a tool, it's an instrument that we use to remove the most common barriers that persons with disabilities have. And it needs to be seen in hand in hand, going hand in hand with assistive technology, reasonable accommodation, so personalized measures. Only when achieving uh, that uh, joint effort of accessibility and reasonable accommodation will we be able to achieve equal access. Now, uh, in the slide that you are seeing, I'm not going to enter into all details, what, you, what we have there is quite a large number of accessibility legislation in Europe of, of legal acts that contains accessibility provisions. What is unique uh, and we have thematics in the area of transport, we have some horizontal uh, legislation, for example, in the web accessibility, and uh, some funding related regulations. But what's unique about the European Accessibility Act it is that it's purely dedicated to regulate accessibility. It has a very strong component on, um, in the area of ICT, and um, what it does is it turns the paradigm shift from many existing accessibility legislation that it talks about what people need towards saying how products and services should be looking like. What are those characteristics that they need to have in order for them to be accessible? So I'm not confronted with GDPR problems because it's not talking about the people, it's talking about how the products, how the services need to function, to be interface and be manageable. Okay, so what does the Act do? In fact, it does, oh, sorry, I went to, I'm going backwards, I'm um, sorry, um, good, yes, okay. So the Act does do two main things. First, it takes a number of products and services and requires that they are going to be accessible when they are placed in the market. All products, we're not talking about dedicated products, but really they all have to be accessible. And I will tell in a minute which are those products and services. It uses exactly, this is the second thing that it does, it uses exactly the same accessibility requirements to um, be applicable in public procurement and when EU funds are being spent. In that way, we reconcile, we reconcile the demand and the supply. Industry is obliged to produce products and services which are accessible, public authorities are obliged to buy those accessible, to spend public money with those products and services with the same accessibility requirements. There are two special things I want to mention, and there are others, um, and that is that for the first time this Act requires that the accessibility of the responses of public authorities to emergency communications, so when a person with disability calls for emergency, there is an obligation to respond in an accessible way, in the same way that the person has called. So we're not talking about what is the what are the issues, the impairment, the disability of the person? We are saying when you receive a call using real-time text, you respond in real-time text. Mm -hmm. When you receive um, total conversation in a call, you respond using total conversation. This is the first extra thing. And the second thing is about the built environment. There we have an optional clause. Why? Because member states are doing already a lot on the built environment, but member states can opt in and demand from themselves or commit themselves to use the accessibility requirements on the Act. Okay, so this is in a nutshell what the Act does. Now, what are the services that the Act uh, contains? We have got electronic communication, so all kinds of telecommunication services, except machine to machines, this was uh, carved out and said at the moment, including emergency communications. So service providers, telecom providers have to make sure that the service, the line they offer you is accessible also for calling emergency numbers. It's about providing access to audiovisual media services when they are in websites, when they are in apps, when they are, those have to be accessible. Certain elements of um, transport, because we are complementing existing passenger rights legislation at European level, but this is about information. On, uh, it's about websites, it's about um, mobile apps, and, and so forth, real-time information. This needs to be also accessible. It's about consumer banking, so that a person can do their finance on their own using all kinds of apps and computer applications. 
is about ebooks and dedicated software. Also for all kinds of applications is, is leisure books, but we are talking also here about educational books. Any ebook placed in the market from uh, the date of application will have to be accessible. And it is about e-commerce. Whatever is sold in the European market under e-commerce rules will have to be accessible. I come now to the products. We're talking about a very common daily products. It's about computers and operating systems, um, telephones, audiovisual media, TV, set-up boxes, you name it, but also self-service terminals. And um, we are talking about um, payment terminals. Any payment terminal, any, pay, any terminal that is connected with a credit card with your bank account will have to be accessible um, in Europe. Some um, also terminals dedicated to the services in the directive, which is um, ATMs, we're talking about ticketing machines, checking machines, and information and information machines. We're talking also about, um, uh, yeah, as I said, the, tele the telephones, the computers, the, and also um, the e-readers. Whenever there is a dedicated e-reader for particular formats of books, they will have to be accessible. So what is the structure of the Act? The Act contains certain obligations. It says, okay, this product, this service have to comply with these requirements. When they do so, they get those product services get the right of free movement in the European market. They can be placed anywhere in the Union as regards accessibility. It puts obligations on economic operators for continuously checking and complying with the obligations and reporting about it. And on products, you can, the operators will put the same marking saying we comply with the accessibility requirements. And service providers in the terms of conditions when you get a service sold or a contract for a service will have to contain what are those accessibility provisions. And it allows for developing technical specifications and standards to further elaborate on the accessibility requirements. Let me pass to a very important part of the uh, Act, of the European Accessibility Act, which is um, enforcement. Enforcement starts very soft. It puts obligation on the economic operators to self-declare that they comply with the requirements. But of course, we trust that that is the case. But trust is always accompanied by checks. So member states are asked to, the, to nominate market surveillance authorities and authorities responsible for compliance with services. And um, they will have the obligation to check that whatever is placed in the market is correct in relation to the accessibility requirements of the directive. And if not, start asking for remedial action to ensure compliance. They also receive complaints from users, from persons with disabilities. But when these measures do not work, the Accessibility Act allows consumers and organizations representing consumers to go to court, to take um, and um, to engage into, um, into a procedures that would allow um, that uh, even there could be penalties that need to be effective, proportionate and dissuasive. The intention is to have remedial action, it's not to make anybody rich about this. So also in those penalties it's included the possibility to, to impose remedial actions mm -hmm. because we want to have an, um, uh, an, accessible, uh, an accessible Europe. These provisions are not applicable, I need to say, to procurement procedures. Just to finish, Two things, uh, two slides uh, uh, more. The uh, directive uh, contains an an and several annexes. In the first one, we have the accessibility requirements. By the way, we work very closely with other parts of the world, the US and uh, also with Canada, in order to be sure that these requirements are common globally to avoid fragmentations of the market. And then we have some uh, annex with examples and the, with the conformity assessment uh, procedures and so forth. There is a safeguard in the directive that, is, that it should, those requirements should not impose disproportionate burden and there is an annex explaining uh, how. Let me say that um, uh, the requirements say, uh, concern you, the user interface, functionality, information about the accessibility of those products and services but also information in accessible format. To finish, to indicate that um, 28 of June uh, last year was the deadline when this directive, this European law, and um, so it's not the case. So I'll stop now. Thank you, uh, Michael Lada. Um,
And just to, to reaffirm, McAdell has re represented the Commission, and what she has told us about is really important from the perspective of European Union member states and their obligations now in relation to accessibility requirements. So again, a lot of learning there uh, from a global perspective. We're now going to move to Chile. So I'm delighted to welcome Daniel Concha Gamboa, who's National Director of Senedis, and he's representing the government of Chile. And Daniel will be talking about the National Universal Accessibility Plan. So the floor is yours now. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Daniel Concha Gamboa, Director of the National Disability Service in Chile. And I want to thank to see your project for the invitation, whom for the second time have invited us to present an initiative. On the previous occasion, we presented our online Senadis Academy for Public Servants. This time, I'm pleased to present a very important country challenge, the National Universal Accessibility Plan. Next slide, please. The problem to solve in Chile, it's Chile is a little country uh, compared with India. We have only uh, 19 million people and close to 2.8 million people in Chile experience some level of disability. That is 17.6 of the adult population. They face significant accessibility barriers, for example, in two evaluations of accessibility to the architectural environments of public buildings, it was determined that only 12% then comply with the minimum standard in force in universal accessibility to receive people with disability. In 2016, in a sample of 800 14 buildings, only 8% were complained. In 2018, in a new study with a smaller sample, 215 buildings, it was determined that 12% with the universal accessibility regulation. Also, in web accessibility, Senadis has a accessibility guide based on the WCAG guidelines. In a survey that made to public institution by another government division, only 8% declared to have applied this guide. Besides, all this happening in context of insufficient and not well-coordinated public policies with an important lack of knowledge in our institution about accessibility and inclusion disability. That was because the last year we create an online course of Senadis in order to educate the public servants in accessibility issues. Next slide, please. So the National Accessibility Plan is a public policy instrument, is a means developed to organize and coordinate a specific objectives in, of the ministry and the territorial agency in the short, medium term, and also the long term to assume goals, define budgets, and meet deadlines. It's a very ambitious plan, but the idea is to get and achieve the goals to become a more accessible country. Next slide, please. The first thing, and I think the most important thing about this plan is our national accessibility plan has not made by us, Senadis, not even inside the government. It was developed by a special commission called Accessibility Advisory Council formed by 15 members with experience who comes from organization of accessibility disability. It is also the result of different instances of social participation where persons with disabilities and its organization show up their needs and expectations based on it. This council 
made a proposal to the government, which it adjust in consultation with the public institution involved. I think, and I want to repeat, this is a more important participatory process because in Chile there is a law what said it's very clear that we can not do anything without consulting persons with disability. Next slide, please. This plan is consequence has 120 initiatives in 13 priority areas, which will be done by 16 responsible operators in the central and the I think we're losing Dan. Yes. Okay, I think we're having broadband problems. We're having problems. to the accessibility norms and standards. We expect to make changes from the cities to the technologies, from the public policies in accessibility to education, to science and technology, all connected to the same goal, to improve the quality of life of people with disability through universal accessibility in services, physical spaces, technologies and communications. Finally, the Ministry of House and City, for example, have comprised improved the national regulation of accessibility in building more accessible houses, and the Ministry of Art of Cultures, for example, has promised to give accessibility to artist format and media, as well as the possibility for artists with disabilities to access for, for public funds. And finally, next slide, the last one, our challenges. You have and you see all have number one. I didn't want to put it one, two, three, four. I think simultaneously we have a common query is how the country expects to finance this plan. We have to propose a system, a framework where the, we transform accessibility diagnostic into project portfolios and those portfolios into requests for public funds from regional government and the state financing bodies. For financing to exist, there must be an idea and based on the national accessibility plan. Ideas are now commitments and orders from the president of the Republic. Senadis will be in charge of monitoring and technically guiding this process. Thank you very much. I'm finished. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel, for giving us the Chilean government approach in relation to developing accessibility in your country. Very, very impressive. We're now going to keep moving to stay on time. We're now moving to Poland online. And I'm happy to introduce now Malgorzata Jaruzanska Jedniak, Secretary of State, Ministry of Development, Funds and Regional Policy, the Government of Poland. So the floor is yours, Malgorzata. Thank you very much. I try to be very quickly. Good afternoon, everyone. Please, the next slide. I would like to present you today. The next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to present you today our Polish experience in systemic uh, solutions towards higher accessibility in public sector. Uh, we have adopted an Accessibility Act in 2019, but its uh, provisions were based on a set of challenges that we have identified. First of all, we faced a very different expectation towards this loop. Many people with disabilities expect the greatest possible accessibility of every public space, transport, services, etc. But public authorities and public sector 
was much more conservative to change. It must be underlined that process of um, population aging is seriously advanced in Poland. At the end of 2020, number of people aged 60 plus amount to 10 million, which is more than one quarter. In 2050, it's going to be one third of the Polish society. The scope of the Accessibility Act covers mainly public sector. The key role of public was reflected in a number of obligations under the Accessibility Act, but also has to face a high level of expenditure. Please, the next slide. Accessibility Act is a practical implementation of Article 9 UN Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities. It guarantees that all the investment made by public sector will, will have the accessibility program. It provides rules, principles, obligations, while the program is based on projects and provides financial support. Implementation of this law significantly increased awareness of the public sector to become more accessible and client friendly. The legal provisions are pretty flexible. Accessibility cost can be scalable and adjusted accordingly to the capacity of the public agents. Please, the next slide. The minimum requirements to ensure the accessibility of, of uh, public entities covers architectural accessibility. We require, for example, barrier free communication spaces access to all rooms in the buildings, visual, voice, and tactile information. Digital accessibility, we require websites and apps accessible according to WCAG, WCAHIG 2.1 standards and providing digital accessibility self-declaration on a website. Information and communication accessibility. We require means to uh, means and tools supporting communication with hearing, vision, and mentally uh, impaired people. In an individual cases, if public entity is unable to provide accessibility, in particular for technical reasons, it's obliged to provide alternative access. And the next slide. Looking at the legal mechanism of the act, we can point out the most important tools. Under the Article 6 of the Accessibility Act, we have set up the minimum requirements to ensure the accessibility of public entities. It covers several obligations such as barrier freeways, sign language, etc. Thanks to the uh, coordination system, accessibility implementation results are systematically monitored. Every public entity have to upload on its website a self-declaration on accessibility, and every four years it's served and the general summary report for the country is prepared. Access officers have to be nominated in governmental and self-governmental units. All the services, outsources or commissioned uh, by the public entities should have accessibility uh, predicted in the contracts. Complaint about the um, inaccessibility, a financial penalty is possible for the public entity which breaks the rules of accessibility. We have established an um, and, um, accessibility fund. It's a new financial instrument which financing architectural changes, for example, elevators, driveways, uh, dr driveways and etc. And it's our first step. And another is implementation of European Accessibility Act. So we are now in, in the process. 
thank you very much for your attention and I hope so that we will have very good discussion. Thank you, Malgrazata. Thank you. Um, Michael has said to me that I can have one question at the very end um, and I'm delighted because speaking as an Irish person we, we tend not to stay on time and we do like to ask lots of questions so it's great to be complimented that I'm relatively on time. So we will ask one question towards the end of our distinguished um, guests as well. So last but by no means least and I'm delighted that he's here in the room with us, we're going to have a presentation now from Israel from Dan Rachel, who's the Commissioner for Equal Rights for People with Disabilities from the Ministry of Justice, so representing the Government of Israel. The floor is now yours, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Uh, can I... S thank you. So, um, we... I'm about to tell you about an amendment to uh, the law of... Uh, the, um, the law of equal rights for persons with disabilities that was initially legislated in 1998 um, and with the purpose to promote and protect all rights of all people with disabilities in Israel. Um, what this law also did is actually defined and determined uh, the commission, the commission of equal rights for persons with disabilities uh, under the Ministry of Justice in Israel. Um, the, this law basically set the authorities and the um, responsibilities of this commission, uh, which I'm currently heading, and with the vision and the purpose to ensure that all people with disabilities in Israel are able to enjoy equal rights and equal opportunities uh, to allow them live regular and meaningful lives uh, to, to, to the extent possible. It also establishes that people with disabilities, of course, have the right to participate in all, all aspects of society, as we all aspire for. And at, at the initiation of this legislation in 1998, it was, uh, it included a set of enforcement powers, uh, civil, administrative, as well as criminal, to, to be able to enforce the law. Uh, and under those initial uh, enforcement tools, violators of, of the law would receive either administrative warrants to order them uh, to fix violations within a reasonable time frame, uh, and if a violation is not fixed within the given time frame, uh, some sort of a criminal procedure would be initiated. Uh, but if the violation is indeed fixed, there would be no financial penalties for the entire time or the entire period that the violation was actually in place. Uh, this initial legislation in 1998 had a few major shortcomings that, uh, that led to uh, the, the need to, to make amendments, which I'll get to in a minute. So the shortcomings, the main ones, were lack of effective enforcement of the accessibility provisions. Uh, there was no sufficient incentive or motivation for violators to fix violations and uh, make themselves accessible. Uh, it was also quite inadequate uh, and lacking balance. Uh, the, me the powerful criminal enforcement procedures and the actual violations. Uh, it just didn't make too much sense for a uh, uh, minor or, or major accessibility violations to be dealt with uh, in a criminal procedure. It just fell too much. Uh, and um, as a result, the, the initial legislation wasn't as effective, like we said, and needed uh, to be changed. Enters uh, Amendment 23 to the law, which we were able to pass this past summer and which would go into effect this coming summer. Uh, this aimed at providing more effective and proportionate administrative enforcement tools mainly uh, three major ones that uh, include financial sanctions, which means fines on violators of accessibility. Uh, there's, still, uh, there's still a way for administrative warnings before uh, doing anything else, but there's also a unique option 
to take an obligation to fix a violation and avoid further penalties uh, by deposit, depositing a, some sort of a collateral, a financial collateral. Now, the rationale is the higher the level of compliance with the regulations of a certain violator, the more considerate the measure taken against that violator would be. Um, there is also an aspect of the severity and timing of measures that were set in accordance to the type and size of violator, meaning that um, a violator that is a major entity, either private or public or any other entity, uh, a violation of that sort of, of that size of a violator would be seen as more severe and more harsh, I guess, uh, and, and the timing uh, that, that the sanctions would be laid on, that sort of violator would be much more immediate than on smaller uh, and, and more, uh, and I would say weaker violators. Now, the, the whole process, the procedure of passing and implementing this new amendment, this new le legislation was quite an ordeal. It was, was a fiasco that uh, happily we were able to do it, but it included the, the need to overcome numerous major objections from both the public and private sectors. Uh, reasonably, they have their own interests, they have their own uh, ideas, and, and it was, they have also political power. It wasn't easy to, to deal with all those pressures. Uh, we also made sure that there are two important parameters taken into a consideration in passing this new legislation. One is, like I mentioned before, the economic and size capacity of the people who are obliged to, to, uh, to implement the law. Uh, the more, uh, the bigger the size and the stronger uh, the obligee, the, uh, the harsher the measures and the more immediate actions could be taken. And the fact that some, many of the obligees rely on professional, what we call accessibility experts, uh, who are professional experts that, that advise them on how to become accessible. And if an entity relied on such an expert, but still committed uh, accessibility violations, the violations would be seen not as, as harsh and not as, as, as I guess, bad as, as those who, who neglected to use such an expert. Um, we are also taking actions uh, to increase the understanding of obligees of their specific obligations, actions like uh, a broad, a huge public campaign that we're now uh, undergoing. Uh, as well as uh, we encourage and develop technolo technological tools to help entities uh, know their obligations uh, and even in many ways instruct them what they have to do in order to, uh, to comply and, and to do it right. Uh, that's it. So um, we are very, very excited about uh, the next few months, this coming summer, in which we will uh, start implementing this new legislation and hopefully bring us to a better place as far as uh, Israel being more accessible. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank, you, thank you, Dan, for that excellent overview and the efforts that Israel is, try, is trying to make in this area. We do, we'll just take one question, so maybe Immaculate, if, if I can maybe ask you to maybe ask one further exploratory question for Dan, please. Mm -hmm. So, uh, really very interesting, and uh, I wanted to know um, to what extent this um, Amendment 23 represents uh, really a major, um, a major step uh, in really enforcing um, a right that, that should be a right anyway, and um, what possibilities did persons with disabilities have before this amendment uh, to enforce, to ask that, that right to be enforced? Well, um the rights, I mean, many, many of the persons with disabilities rights, and of course, among them accessibility rights, um, have existed for decades now. Uh, and uh, there is significant progress, but not nearly enough than, what, uh, than, than where we should be. Mm -hmm. 
and that, that made us, that made, uh, I guess, Ministry of Justice a few years ago think about uh, this, this new amendment and, and, and giving the commission more powers and more tools, uh, and I guess more creative tools to, uh, to give us the power to enforce accessibility. And as far as your other question, um, you know, b before this, I mean, people can still, um, with accordance to the law, to the uh, equal rights for people with disabilities law, uh, take legal action, either on their own or with our help in the commission, we, we, we provide those services uh, to, uh, to individuals. Uh, we, can, we can sue on behalf of individuals and on behalf of the state, uh, we are the state, um, private entities, but also sue the state. We have those powers. So, so these powers uh, are still an option for, 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 for people. Uh, they can come to us and we can do that. But now, you know, there's this new tool that, that will be more immediate and, and hopefully more effective. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. And also thank you to McLeod for that question. So we're now coming to a close to this session. Finally, before I hand over to Michael, who will talk about the takeaway messages and the next steps, just from me, from the WHO Regional Office uh, for Europe perspective, thank you to Zero Pocket for organising this event. This has been fantastic to get member states and organisations together to share their experience of trying to promote accessibility and disinclusion, uh, disability inclusion policies. And to our speakers, thank you for taking the time to come here. Do strongly encourage people to make connections with each other and to look at the material that's on the website following these sessions. So thank you very much. Thank you also from, from my side. Uh, uh, this was much more than some simple presentations. Thank you for all the presenters to work with us. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, a good work together, uh, but it doesn't end here. So as mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have two people in the room. Uh, so, so Fritz and Anna Lucia, please stand up. One is, will be the editor of a report that we're doing, and we also want Anna Lucia from a Brazilian Human Rights Law Office uh, to also do a, a legal check on this. So we'll do a, a, a report with policy papers based on the presentations today. And you saw at the beginning that Daniela Bass from the UNDESA is taking a, a chairwomanship on this, and we will also take this to the, to the Conference of State Parties, hopefully with your support, uh, and we can hopefully can present this together also at the side event and, and at the UN COSP, and let's see where it takes us in the next step. So thank you, everyone, and just one uh, kind request to all the presenters today. Let's meet for, for a family picture outside the room so that we also have a, a shared memory of this presentation today. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, well done. Yeah, it was a journey.